welcome to Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns. It's a podcast by the Center for Advanced Innovation. I'm Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advanced Innovation. And I am very, very pleased today to have Ross Youngs on the, on the call with us today. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to join you. So just so, so everybody has this in mind, this is the, the time of everybody is inside, sequestered, and uh, the COVID-19 virus is out there and we are doing a podcast. And we're gonna be sharing some very positive things with everybody today. And so I just wanted to tell you, Ross, how, how great it is to have you on, the, on this podcast. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear some of your valuable content. So can I hand it over to you to introduce yourself? You have an illustrious no, that, career. <laughs> that'd be terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and one of the things I wanted to say is the centers for advancing innovation. You guys have been doing some great work and I thank you guys for that. Um, as far as me, I've been a serial entrepreneur uh, for 32 years. Uh, prior to that, I was involved in the medical imaging business and the optical disc business, uh, involved in uh, the engineering of those businesses and uh, other things involved with that. But when I started my first company, it was a disruptive, technology for the optical disc field went on to hit the inc 500 for five years in a row with that ended up being named the nation's business person of the year in 1998 what's interesting and especially since this is entrepreneurial i bootstrapped that company i took a twenty thousand dollar loan uh, and built a company that exceeded 25 million dollars in sales uh, annually with that Ultimately, I moved into other industries and other businesses, and one of the things that brought me to was uh, plastics industry, and with that, I looked at sustainable plastics. That technology ultimately allowed me to create an invention that was follow-on supported by the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the DOE, so known as ARPA, and then DARPA funded it as well, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And then also it got funded by the US Air Force Research Lab. We invented a technology that we were able to ultimately move into drug discovery and therapeutics. So a path of optical <laughs> and video disc has now got me in drug discovery. And that's just a little bit about me. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But this Amazing, that background. Tell me about some of those pictures behind you and the <laughs> awards. Well, it's kind of a, a little bit of, of history. Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, when I got the five years in a row from Inc. Magazines, they only sent me three of the awards, but I was in the magazine for five years and I'm now in uh, the Inc. Magazine's Hall of Fame. Um, and I also uh, ended up... Uh, getting some awards locally and statewide. So statewide, I was winner of uh, Entrepreneur of the Year in Ohio. And when I did get the award for Entrepreneur of the Year for the whole US, that was award given to me in DC. It was supposed to be given to me in the Rose Garden by uh, President Clinton, which was pretty exciting to yeah. think be in the Rose Garden. But for some reason, they had to take it off site and I ended up getting the award and I had no idea I had won the award. There were 300 people in the audience and all of a sudden I started having microphones put in front of my face <laughs> and people said, you must have won. So the press <laughs> I release, love it, I love it. The press release went out before I got announced the winner and wow. I'm like, no, I couldn't have won. And wow. then I got announced the winner. So it was a very humbling experience. And the one thing I can say about the experience is a lot of times politicians get um, maligned in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I can say that I had a conversation with Al Gore up there before the podium announcement. Mm -hmm. And he is categorically one of the smartest, quickest people I'd ever run into. So I give him a lot of kudos for what he's been able to do post political, uh, but it was a pleasure meeting him originally. And some of the other stuff is, um, ended up participating in an R&D 100 award with Battelle, which is a major research uh, organization 
based in Columbus, but they run uh, many of the national labs around the whole U.S. So that was a privilege to be involved with them in an award. And actually the Ohio Soybean, uh, I think it's the Ohio Soybean Council was part of that award as well. So I've had a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different things. And someone could say 30 years is a long time. Well, this is kind of proof of a long time. Yeah, it's amazing. In fact, look at this. I got to get something. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen this. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> that is so cool. R&D so 100. You I participated. Was I was at keynote. He had two keynotes one year at the R&D 100 conference. Well, so you've, been a, quite, you've quite been a leader in innovation, so <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> Sorry, took my earplugs out. Well, no problem. I just mentioned <laughs> that you've been a leader in innovation. <laughs> and, uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's very kind. Well, I mean, it's really interesting that you've had so you've worked in so many different industry sectors. That's very unusual. Many people don't even know how to to transform themselves. I mean, the the models for uh, life sciences. You know, when we do financial models, they're like twenty year financial models. So, and the models you do financial models you do in the high tech field are like three year financial models. So, I mean, the industries are, are the dynamics are so different. Was it difficult to go from one industry to another? Well, since I'm in the startup phase of uh, therapeutics, the healthcare industry, I really am just getting introduced to the earliest portion. Once we start doing licensing, and it'll, we'll typically do licensing with people that are experienced with developing therapeutics, their models will be what we rely on. So mm -hmm. we don't have to do those models. The kind of modeling that we do early is around the discovery and finding advantages and using our platform to, let's say, accelerate discovery and then find opportunities. Since we're not a single biotech, we're actually a platform technology. We don't have to depend on one molecule or one class of molecules. We're in an opportunity that we can develop many different opportunities to feed researchers and to feed pharma companies. Well, so I know you have 75 patents, right? Global yes. patents. And what is your process of thinking about new inventions? Well, you know, it, it, it really is more Edison-like and a lot of people don't understand how creation works. You can either create from total scratch, which is a real, real rarity, or you can create when there's a working model. Edison was known to be highly inventive, but there was actually a working model for everything he pursued. Some of those working models sucked, and he <laughs> was able, through his own diligence and determination, figure out how to make improvements that mm. made a difference. Mm. So I'm, I'm observant. Um, so when I run into a problem, for some reason, I think it's the wealth of exposure to different technologies. Um, I really am a generalist. I've had deep exposure to mechanical, electrical processing systems. And then I've had exposure to biology, chemistry, uh, math. So I'm not very good at any one of them, <laughs> in all honesty, but I'm good enough to pull things together in ways others have never been able to pull them together. So I'm observant, and when I see a problem, it's funny, some of the solutions just come to me. Now, if a solution or a problem is there and a solution doesn't come to me, my process is really to study it, to study what's around it, to study what others are doing, and at the same time, study it in a way nobody would ever think of. So if, if somebody said, we wanna invent a new type of pin, mm -hmm. what questions could you ask yourself about this pin that have never been asked about a pin? Well, you could say, what if you put wheels on it? Mm. Well, that's a stupid question. <laughs> what, if you, what if you put a sunshade on it? What if you made it electronic? What if you used it for a highway marker? Mm. 
-hmm. There's a zillion stupid questions you can <laughs> ask about a problem that actually gets you thinking outside of the way everyone in the world has always thought. Mm. And that's one of the processes that I use in order to think about things very differently than anybody else. Very interesting. So is that, what, what, what other parts of the methodology is, are there? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, it's important for anybody that's doing inventing to understand their space and their clarity. Mm -hmm. um, so I am also an investor um, like yourself. So when I see opportunities to invest in something and I take it serious enough to do due diligence, one of the things I do is looking at, do they have patents? Um, and if they do, or if they think they're going to, who is doing what in their space? Mm -hmm. So I go to a lot of the online fundraising sites, whether it's Angel List or there's hundreds out there, mm -hmm. and I do searches. Mm -hmm. And if something comes up, somebody tells me about a new wearable device that's going to change the world, and if I look online and I dig into it deep enough, am I finding the same pursuit by other teams elsewhere in the world? Mm -hmm. I like novel, I like new, I like totally innovative, or I like a team that has done something that's really special. So mm. the process is the same around my own creation. So if I create something, I want to know who's doing it or even close to it. And that's one of the key things. Mm -hmm. Well, just to switch gears, you know, you're doing with Biosortia, what are you doing in the microbiome, and combining microbiome research with combating the coronavirus? Well, the coronavirus itself, um, we look at our platform, our drug discovery platform, as ultimately being able to provide researchers in the future. We can't do anything right now about the current outbreak. And I'm glad there is a number of companies out there that have, uh, let's say some weapons uh, in their arsenal against the coronavirus that are getting implemented. Um, and it's for sure that there could be uh, new opportunities down the line that really make uh, COVID-19 um, in material in the future, and we hope that happens. But everything that we're doing is building the platform capability to find future antivirals. So most antivirals on the market today have been either directly or indirectly inspired by nature or have been inspired by genomics. And those antivirals, I hate to put it this way, they don't work that well. They don't have, humanity does not have an arsenal of antivirals. And an example of that is, as you hear we're fighting COVID-19, they're talking about using a potential drug that was useful in um, other diseases mm -hmm. and bringing it into uh, the opportunity to fight COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We believe that there can be an entire uh, arsenal of weapons against antivirals. And it's gonna to have to come from nature. And our platform does the deepest dive into the 99% of completely hidden molecules that nature makes that researchers have never gotten their hands on. And it's not just genomics. We can obtain the actual chemistry of microbiomes and the unculturable microbes. So it's that capability that no one in the world possesses that we think we can deploy in future hunt, hunting of antiviral starting points. So does your platform also uh, discover the antivirals that need to be created? Well, currently our platform is, you could separate it into two things. Um, so in what we do in finding molecules, we have to go get enough starting material from nature. That technology was the technology funded by ARPA, DARPA, U.S. Air Force, and others. Because getting microbes out of any environment 
and collecting them in the kind of quantity and quality where you preserve their chemistry, that's really never existed to the kind of scale needed to find molecules in really minute quantities. So that technology is fully at scale. It's proven and we can process the equivalent of 20 million liters of an aquatic microbiome to get at that hidden chemistry, giving us a starting material point that is already pretty close to a hundred uh, to a thousand times more than what typical researchers even start with. Now we've got this massive amount of starting material and we've got the capability to get it, but believe it or not, Nobody has the capability to mine it. So as big as medical research is, when they do culturing of microbes in a lab, in big bioreactors, and they get that biomass out so they can study it for chemistry, mm -hmm. usually that's 100 to 200 grams of dry weight material. Mm -hmm. And they take that into their lab, and they slice and dice it through extractions and fractionations mm -hmm. so they can study it again for its activity mm -hmm. and for its chemistry. We don't deal with 100 to 200 grams. We deal with really what is 50,000 to 100,000 grams, and we have a million grams in reserve. Mm -hmm. It's that material that nobody has the capacity on the planet to dig into and that's microbiome mining and that's what we want to do in our execution we want to execute our uh, technologies to grab the microbiome and we need to execute our technologies to mine the microbiome everything we need to do to mine the microbiome is off the shelf so we're out there trying to find people that can understand this breakthrough and it's hard in the medical world, it's hard in the research world to do something totally different. Mm -hmm. And this has never been done by anybody, this kind of prospecting at this kind of depth. Hmm. So um, can you talk about how you, uh, you originally, the, how, you, how does this work? You know, the algae harvesting technology Mm -hmm. is what you led to the development of um, Biosource's drug discovery platform? It, it is. It, it's what has given us the capability to mine the microbiome. And microbes themselves, if you think about it, whether it's your gut microbiome or the closest body of water to you, mm -hmm. typically a microbiome has about 500 to 1,000 species that are living in a community, mm -hmm. a consortia of organisms and they're signaling each other, turning things on, off, up, or down, and they're all single cells. And everything evolved from microbes. So the reality of is even a human gut microbiome and a, let's say the ocean closest to you, mm -hmm. has an overlap in genes and metabolic pathways of 73%. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of similarity between any microbiome on the world that you can get your hands in. The problem is those 500 to 1,000 species themselves, they're different sizes, mm -hmm. they're different densities, they're different fragilities. They can break apart in processing. If you let them sit for minutes, mm -hmm. they will change their metabolic pathways. They'll start to degrade and it'll turn into sludge. So the challenge was getting microbes out of a area and separating them from the liquid or from their surrounding habitat. And that challenge in that is that any traditional technology will fail. You'll break apart the microbes, you'll miss microbes, or you'll end up uh, dwelling too long and the microbes will turn into sludge. In our process, we don't use traditional filtration technology. We use what really is uh, an inspiration from nature, which is how uh, water has the capability to adhere and co-adhere to itself and other materials. 
So it's a technology that we ended up patenting that allows us to pull the water away from the solids without actually using the solids um, and forcing solids to stay on a screen as you move the water past it. So it, it's really a different approach to filtration that has allowed us to pursue this. Mm. And in the pursuit of this, we had to advance the equipment to a scale that could work in our concept, which we've done. And we can now process uh, a million to two million liters in a day. Typically, I have research papers that showed people tried to process 100 liters and talked about how hard that was. Mm. But we're doing a million to two million liters per day. And by the time we pull it out of its habitat to the point where we actually preserve it mm -hmm. is a matter of two minutes and 14 seconds. So the metabolic pathways don't really change. We capture the chemistry of microbiomes and nobody's been able to do that. So we really are opening up a new way ultimately for science to explore the hidden chemistry of life. So are you working with anyone who's doing the uh, analysis component, the discovery, so to speak? We have. We actually are working uh, uh, with Professor Matt Burton up at uh, University of Rhode Island. We've worked with uh, people in the University of Michigan, uh, UCSD, Ohio State, and other uh, institutes to find early hits and essentially prove out the platform can find novel, therapeutically relevant new chemistry. The challenge is somebody like us, we've spent so much time, effort, energy in developing and proving the platform. The model in pharma and biotech is bring me a de-risk asset. Mm -hmm. But what happens is we get asked, what's your de-risk asset? Mm -hmm. And we have to explain we don't have one yet because we were focused on building the technology to bring hundreds of de-risk assets. And we're just not at the scale where pharma will pay attention yet, which is another challenge for a startup business to overcome our, in our case. So how are you overcoming it? Well, we're overcoming it quite frankly by not talking to pharma and biotech. And that <laughs> sounds counterintuitive, but here's what, we've realized this is a dramatic disruption to mm -hmm. Clayton Christensen, who is, I got his book on my shelf here, is one of my heroes. Unfortunately, he passed away in January of this year, wrote the book on disruption, uh, an innovator's dilemma. dilemma. <laughs> and, the, and, and what he taught us in his years of pursuits is large established companies can't do disruption. They miss it every time. And one of the best examples I love telling, and I hope you don't mind me telling this, is when Steve Jobs stood up on stage and said, this is Apple's cell phone. This is our iPhone. You know what Blackberry, Motorola, uh, Ericsson, um, anybody that was in Nokia, anybody that was in cell phones yeah. or invested in cell phones thought at the time. They thought that fool is trying to get into our business. He has no idea what he's doing. He's going to fail miserably. Well, we all know the end of it. <laughs> yeah. He created a disruption that wasn't going to happen inside the cell industry. He was outside the cell industry. Luckily, he had the dollars behind him to create that disruption. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's going on with Biosortia. I can pretty much guarantee 10 years. 15 years from now, there will hardly be a research institute or pharma company that isn't looking into microbiome mining and exploring the molecules that they can actually grab as opportunities. And I can say this with all confidence because the golden age of pharma occurred in the 50s and the early 60s and they were culturing microbes to find opportunities. Mm. Culturing led to a wealth of opportunities and ultimately 
more than 50% of the drugs that are on the shelf today. Why did they quit doing that? Yeah, why did they quit doing that? They quit doing it because only 1% of the microbes on the planet can grow in a culture. Mm. So they found more than 50% of all the drugs on the shelf from that 1%. When they realized they kept running into the same molecules because of a lack of culturing the unculturable, that's when they pivoted <laughs> to combinatorial chemistry, mm -hmm. which is using a super chemistry kit to create drugs. Mm -hmm. And they spent, pharma and researchers spent billions of dollars a year for over 40 years. And you know how many drugs they got from those pursuits? One. Um, hmm. Now, that's interesting. So they pivoted away from that indirect approach and took up genomics. Mm -hmm. We all know 25 years ago, the promise of genomics. Mm -hmm. The promise of genomics is as soon as we have the human genome figured out, we're going to know everything. Well, what we know now is we don't know anything. And <laughs> all we pulled off was the thinnest layer of an onion in order to talk about what we could do. Um, we now know another layer is epigenomics, another layer is the microbiome. So the reality of it is, is even genomics has failed to deliver actual drugs on the shelf. And that's another indirect approach. So all we're saying to the world is it makes sense to go back to what worked the best and solve the problems of getting at these hidden mm. microbes. Mm -hmm. And that's really how we looked at it. And that's what we're doing. Solving problems. Solving problems. <laughs> and unfortunately, solving problems takes resources. And since you're doing something new, getting resources, especially in the pharma world or in the research world, where everyone is in silos. Yeah. So they only know what they know in their silo. Mm -hmm. and, and the other challenge is, and no offense to the scientific principle, I, I totally support the scientific principle, but everything is rejected until it's categorically uh, uh, reviewed Proven. and approved. Proven, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So interestingly enough, there was another book written in 1962 talking about how hard it is to break through new technologies into pharma. And then um, it was actually Clayton Christensen who wrote in 2000 uh, a, an entire report on will disruption ever hit therapeutics or drug discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have the, the, the secret weapon, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it, you know, it, most entrepreneurs don't really become entrepreneurs until they have felt and faced adversity that would probably put their company out of business multiple times. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that the people around me uh, know, I'm tenacious. I also don't pursue things that are impossible. I pursue things that are likely. I'm a very conservative investor. And someone can say, why in the world are you doing this then? Well, I'm a very conservative investor, and this is incredibly important to humanity. Mm. So what is your next step? Well, my next step is I mentioned earlier that going to the typical pharma VCs mm -hmm. who have their models in the typical pharma uh, itself has not shown a possibility of getting funded. We have no possibility of getting funded in those routes. So what we're doing is we're trying to approach other entrepreneurs, other people that have been successful. Consider them mm -hmm. high net worth individuals mm -hmm. that understand how hard things are, 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 let's say, excited about doing something revolutionary that could positively impact the world. So we've been stretching ourselves into those kind of circles, which is very hard to do because mm -hmm. they're gatekeepers that keep people like me away, rightfully so, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. But that's really who we've pursued for this is we're trying to find high net worth individuals that can get excited about breaking the mold. Mm -hmm. And the way cost of drug discovery and cost of development in 
the drug discovery market has occurred, it's occurred because they've done everything indirectly. We actually think, just like in electronics, that there could possibly be a demonetization of cost of developing drugs. And that's for several reasons. One of those reasons is natural products, things that already work in biology, are categorically the best starting materials for drugs. That's been proven over time. It's mm -hmm. easier to take a molecule out of microbes and turn it into a drug than it is to take a microbe out of some kind of inspiration from, let's say, uh, synthetic chemistry or from genomics and try to turn that into a drug. And that's one of the advantages of natural products. But natural products have been so de-emphasized since really the 50s and 60s, there's hardly many researchers that focus in this area. So it's going to come back around and change the dynamic. Um, so we do believe that the next round of natural products will sync beautifully with genomics and sync beautifully with, uh, uh, what is it, uh, sorry. <laughs> It'll sync beautifully with synthetic chemistry mm -hmm. and also a computational chemistry. So this time around, natural products, especially the molecules from microbes, will be much better than they ever were in the past as far as advancement. Can you maybe tell the audience, the listeners here, what a natural product is? Natural products are, they come from the biology of life. So we hear a lot about molecules from plants that could be used as a drug. Well, mm -hmm. that's a natural product. Uh, penicillin, which came from a fungus, mm -hmm. that was a natural product. So natural products themselves already work in biology and nature. And they should be the starting point or the inspiration for most molecules because all targets that exist have something in biology that hits that target. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where all the inspiration is. But if you don't have access to those molecules, then you have to try. And I don't give, I, you know, pharma does not have a black eye over this. They tried with combinatorial chemistry, they're trying with genomics, they're trying with synthetic biology. All of those are brilliant tools, but it's hard to do things when you start with infinity. And what I mean there is just look at it this way in genomics. You have got an infinite number of possibility of genes and organisms that interact with those genes with their genes. It's an infinite possibility. But the chemistry all these organisms make is finite. There's a finite number you can pursue, or there's the infinite number you can pursue. It's logical to pursue finite. Mm -hmm. That's the dynamic change that we have. So I have a, one last question for you. Um, what advice would you give to the entrepreneurs that are listening in on how to remain tenacious when they have a breakthrough product and they have to con convince investors that it's a breakthrough product and raise money that way? Well, one, they better be right. <laughs> right. Okay. That's a really important thing because one of the things that happens with entrepreneurs, and I've seen this, they fall in love with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't ever fall in love with what they're doing. If they're not going to be critical every single step of the way, they will fail. So that would be the first advice that I give an entrepreneur. Never fall in love with what you're doing. Stand at a distance where you can keep to challenge it. Try to find the fault. Try to listen to anybody and everybody why it will not work. Mm -hmm. And if you're still convinced it'll work, then what you've got to do is you've got to believe yourself that all of your own due diligence has led you to something nobody else understands. And I know that I get very motivated when I talk to somebody, even if they can't fund me, but they go, 
Ross, this is amazing. I can't believe you're not funded yet. Mm -hmm. I take that and I plug that in as energy. Mm -hmm. So people do matter. I'm not in a, in, a, in a vacuum by any mean. I go up and down emotionally. But mm -hmm. what I do is I stay determined because I've studied this, looked at this, talked to the experts, challenged every question ever presented to me by other experts, and I still feel completely confident we're on the right path. And this will ultimately, if I can stay tenacious and determined, this will ultimately be adopted. And as it's adopted, what will happen, another book I have on my shelf behind me um, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, we will reach a tipping point. And when we reach that tipping point, things will explode in microbiome mining. And you do see people saying, we, we are doing microbiome mining. Those people are doing genomic microbiome mining, looking at the infinite set to try to figure things out. Mm -hmm. We think microbiome mining is broader. It is the genomics. It is synthetic biology. It is getting at the actual chemistry. And once you get at the actual chemistry like we can do, we can start to understand the structures and the activity of that chemistry. We really will ultimately uncover the secrets of life this way. That's what's incredible. Wonderful. Well, so I, just to try to summarize what you said about, uh, which I really believe is true for entrepreneurs, is the objective. Um, you know, taking a step back, don't be married to your, your uh, invention or whatever it is. Be very open to advice mm -hmm. from others and consider it. And uh, of course, uh, embrace the positive times. Um, and I think that those are, those are my takeaways. <laughs> and of course, your amazing company is uh, going to change the world. We, we hope to have that opportunity. And, and like I've told people is, you know, we're in a position to go very, very slow, virtually on pause, move forward a little bit. We can hold it together as we wait for others to challenge our thought leadership, to actually engage. I can't tell you how many meetings I've had where within the first two minutes, somebody has just blown it off, like, oh, that's impossible. And it's like, oh, well, just please talk to me. <laughs> so it, one of the things that I would say is patience, not only on the entrepreneurial side, but if you're an investor and you don't get it, and you see that it can't possibly work, whack yourself on the side of the head and say, maybe I'm missing something. And that would be a good thing for both sides of your listeners, because I'm sure there's people on both sides of the equation that pay attention to the Centers for Advancing Innovation, which I got a great deal of respect for you and your organization. And I really hope you guys keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Ross. So anything else you want to leave the listeners with? Um, you know what, in, in this time where we're all sequestered and isolated from other people, I've found reaching out to people on video conferencing is amazing. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think I had six of them yesterday. I've enjoyed it. It feels good to connect with people. So even if people are isolated, find a way to connect. And then once we're all back to normal, keep connected. Well, what do you think the new, nor, new normal is going to be? I think the new normal, as, as we progress through this, uh, I think that there's going to be some changes. But I would say we will get back to life as we know it within the year, and mm -hmm. it'll feel pretty normal. But we'll always be looking ahead mm -hmm. and over our shoulder, mm -hmm. because we now recognize big problems can occur from out of the blue. And we should be doing everything we can do to avoid those big problems. And one of those things is let's build an arsenal of antivirals because we will need to have a number of weapons on the shelf to fight this in the future because this isn't the last one. Yeah. 
Well, Ross, thank you so much for your valuable time today and your, your amazing insights. I, I really am very grateful for your, for, uh, being, your being in the, on the podcast. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate uh, uh, being here. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.